Hey guys, and welcome to Chem 152, week 10 of our 15 weeks experience of general chemistry 2, namely week 1 of our online experience. Anyways, we're going to be doing thermodynamics for this week, and from last we met, we kind of got into it, which is in relation to aqueous reactions or reactions that were at equilibrium or slightly off from it. We had an equation of free energy change for a reaction equals its standard free energy change plus RT ln of Q. If the reaction was at equilibrium, that Q would be K. And yeah, we already covered that guy pretty well. Now what we will get into next week is called electrochemical reactions, or essentially where we have a voltage being applied over a reaction. And that first equation is the Nernst equation. Don't worry about that guy for now. What's really cool is that delta G, in this case, would equal NF delta E, or the number of moles times some Faraday constant times the change in electrochemical potential. And, well, yeah, that's all I'm going to talk about that for this week. Electrochemistry, that's going to be next week. Now then, delta G, change in Gibbs free energy. That delta G factor, it's seen in quite a bit of chemistry. So, what is it? It's simply the amount of energy, or the amount of energy that a chemical equation, a chemical reaction, has available to do work, or do more work. Say you have gasoline, you can either combust it, and then there's remaining energy that can either be used to heat a home or power a car. Things like that. What energy is available to do more work? And there are two thermoda thermodynamic principles at work here, namely that delta G equals delta H minus the product of T delta S, or change in free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy minus the product of temperature times change in entropy, where enthalpy is the transfer of energy via heat, and delta S is the change in entropy or disorder, essentially when you rearrange your elements and your atoms in different orientations, different positions, different bond formats, whether double, triple, or different elements bonded in different orientations, that can affect entropy. Now, delta G, pretty cool because it's a, it's a good universal measure of will a reaction happen? Essentially... Let's define the forward direction as reactants going toward products. If delta G for under a certain temperature, if delta G for that forward direction is positive, then you can conclude that that reaction is non-spontaneous at that given temperature. Non-spontaneous means that that reaction will not occur naturally on its own. You need to apply some outside force or you need, you need to apply work onto the uh, reactants in order to force the reaction in the forward direction. Now say if in the forward direction delta G was negative, then at that given temperature, that reaction is spontaneous. It will occur naturally on its own without some outside force. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with kinetics. Kinetics at the beginning of the semester told us how fast a reaction would go, whether in a few seconds or in a few minutes. Delta G is a thermodynamic principle that does not tell you kinetics. It tells you whether a reaction will or will not occur naturally on its own. Even if delta G is negative and the reaction is spontaneous, the reaction might take a few seconds. It could take a few centuries, but it will eventually occur. Now in the situation where delta G is zero, that reaction is actually at equilibrium. So there is no preference in the forward or backwards reaction. And under this scenario, you could make a conclusion on the kinetics in a sense that if you know you're at equilibrium, that means that the forward and backwards reaction rates are equal. But yeah, normally thermodynamics and kinetics Normally they do not overlap.
which is cool that they do under certain conditions of delta G. But anyways, don't worry about any of that. So actually using that main re that main equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Let's say you're given some values of enthalpy change, temperature, and entropy change. And I'm telling you that these are the values for in the forward direction. Well, under those conditions, you could calculate and should be able to calculate the free energy, free energy change or the delta G in the forward direction. And it's pretty simple to do so. So effectively, let's say we have 10, uh, negative 10 enthalpy, and we're going to add the product of 2 Kelvin multiplied, or hold on a second, that should, that should not be plus, that should be minus. So redo. Effectively, let's say we have negative 10 kilojoules per mole from enthalpy, and we are going to subtract from it the product of 2 Kelvin multiplied by negative 6 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So effectively, that would be negative 10 minus a negative 12, or positive 2. Nah, right, cool. Whatever. Positive 2 kilojoules per mole would be the change of free energy for that situation. Now take a different one. Effectively, 20 kilojoules per mole from enthalpy, and we are going to subtract from that the product of 4 times positive 5, <clears throat> or in other words, 20 minus 20. Well, that's 0. Cool. What else? Neither positive nor negative. Whatever. And then next, one last situation. Probably going to be negative because that's the trend. Let's say we have negative 15 kilojoules per mole from enthalpy, and we are going to subtract from that the product of 5 Kelvin multiplied by positive 3 kilojoules per mole Kelvin from entropy. So 15 minus 15, or negative 15 minus 15, would be negative 30 kilojoules per mole of free energy. Now, that's awesome. Whatever. That's a simple way to calculate delta G from the basic thermodynamic principles of enthalpy, entropy, and temperature. Now the cool thing is, we can make certain conclusions on the reaction based off of the sign on the delta G values we calculated. So in the case of the first set of data, if delta G in the forward reaction is positive, then we can conclude that that reaction is non-spontaneous. Effectively, in the forward reaction, non-spontaneous, it will not occur naturally on its own. Maybe we could apply some electrochemical potential to force it to happen, which is what we will see in electrochemistry. But on its own, this reaction, without some outside force, will not occur. Now, in the case of the second set of data where delta G ended up being zero, the conclusion we can make is that the reaction is simply at equilibrium. So, neither wanting to go in the, no preference in the forward reaction or the backwards reaction. And lastly, when delta G is a negative value, well then, if delta G is negative in the forward direction, then we can conclude that that reaction is spontaneous in the forward reaction. It will occur naturally on its own. Anyways, going on, let's say the Ford reaction is all fun and good, but there are some cool principles and properties with uh, thermodynamic principles like delta G. Now, this is something that might have been taught in Chem 151 when it came to enthalpy. These following properties are true of uh, Gibbs free energy, as well as change in entropy. Effectively, how would you calculate the change in free energy in the reverse direction if you have calculated already the change in free energy of the forward direction. Now that's pretty, pretty simple. 
if in the forward reaction your change of free energy is positive 2, then in the reverse re reaction it's going to be negative 2. And if the forward reaction is 0, well then the inverse of 0 or the reverse of 0 is still 0. And then for the case where the forward reaction was negative 30 kilojoules per mole, in that case the reverse reaction would have a positive 30 kilojoules per mole of free energy. Now I'm defining the reverse reaction as going from products to reactants. And that's cool. So in the last slide, we made certain conclusions on the backward on the forwards reaction based off of the sign of delta G in the forward direction. Well now we can likewise make certain conclusions based off of the delta G values in the reverse direction. So in the first case where delta G in the reverse direction was negative, in that case, the reaction in the reverse direction is spontaneous. It was non-spontaneous in the forward direction, but in the reverse direction, it is spontaneous. Now at zero delta G, still at equilibrium. Cool, no change there. And then for a positive delta G when you're going in the reverse reaction, in that case, in the reverse direction, it is non-spontaneous. If I happen to ask you guys to calculate delta G from a certain set of data of enthalpies, temperatures, and entropies, I would also expect you guys to also make certain conclusions either in the forward or the reverse direction. For example, if I ask you in which direction, forward or backwards, is the reaction spontaneous? Well, whichever one is negative, that would be spontaneous. Now here's another really cool thing. And here's the last cool thing I'm going to get to as far as thermodynamics on its own. And it's Hess's law. Hess's law basically says that for enthalpy, for delta H, uh, it doesn't matter whether you go from reactants directly to products or say you go through some intermediate reaction first. As long as what you are starting with and what you are ending with is the same, then the delta G value for that entire process will be the same. And with delta G and also delta S being thermodynamic properties, they let also apply to Hess's law. And so let's take the situation where we don't know the change in free energy for a reaction. In this case, reacting two moles of carbon monoxide with molecular hydrogen to form two moles of solid carbon, and one mole of hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, interesting reaction, I know. Well, let's take for your, the situation of we have two reactions, two, three, whatever number, where we do know the values in delta G. Well then, if we can arrange these two reactions that we do know in such a way that we end up getting the reaction we do care about, then it is possible to calculate delta G for that reaction. And here's, here's how to do it. Let's take for the case where we're having carbon monoxide. Well, in the, in the reaction that we do care about, where we don't know delta G yet, essentially this reaction in the reactants is carbon monoxide. So... Let's look for a reaction that has carbon monoxide in the reactants. Well, all right, cool, the first one's good. Now here's the issue though. The reaction we care about has two moles of carbon monoxide, whereas the known reaction only has one mole, only accounts for one mole carbon monoxide. Well, this is pretty simple. Let's say we take this reaction and we actually multiply everything by two. <coughs> that we multiply everything in this reaction by 2. Effectively what we're saying is we're going to be having 2 moles, so 2 times 1 would be 2 moles of carbon monoxide forming 2 moles of carbon and then if our reaction is 
originally half a mole of O2, then 2 times a half would be 1 mole. So effectively, we just multiplied all the elements in that reaction by 2. Now, how does this affect the change in free energy? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Effectively, that change in free energy is going to cause this to happen. Effectively, if we multiply everything by 2, then we're going to multiply <coughs> delta G by 2 as well. So, if we have our regular carbon monoxide equation being negative 233.1 kilojoules per mole, and we just multiplied everything by 2, in that case, we just have to multiply that value in delta G by 2 to basically get the value of delta G for this part of the reaction. So that ends up being negative 474.2. Let's see, so negative 474.2, and let's see, kilojoules. Cool. So effectively, what we have now is this guy right here. Right now we have two moles of carbon monoxide reacting to form two moles of carbon and one mole of oxygen. All right, cool. We have our two moles of carbon monoxide, and we also have our two moles of carbon in the product side accounted for. Well, now let's look at the second equation, second chemical equation, where we know the value of delta G. This equation is taking hydrogen peroxide and decomposing it into molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen. Well, the reaction we care about has hydrogen and has hydrogen peroxide in it. However, the reaction we care about has hydrogen in the reactant side and per hydrogen peroxide in the product side. This reaction that we do know, the delta G2, essentially has everything in reverse. So, let's just flip it. And if we were to flip this guy, well, that has the property of flipping the sign of delta G. So, let's see. Taking this guy taking hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, and taking molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen and reacting it to form liquid hydrogen peroxide. Well, cool. That's our reaction right there. And luckily in our formula that we do care about, we don't need to worry about multiplying any moles or anything. We have hydrogen up front in the reactant side. We have hydrogen up front in the reactant side in the reaction we do care about. Hydrogen peroxide is in the product side. Hydrogen peroxide is in the product side. Cool. So in this case, delta G is going to be a little bit more simpler since we already know what delta G equals in the normal case of going from hydrogen peroxide and decomposing it. Well, if delta G under that situation is positive 120.24 kilojoules per mole. Well, then in the flipped, in the flip side, this could be 120.4 kilojoules per mole. And now, actually, to take all this into account, like so. So we know that, effectively, let's look at what we got. We have one equation which has two moles of carbon monoxide forming two moles of carbon and oxygen. And we have one reaction of molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen forming hydrogen peroxide. Now in the reaction we care about, we don't actually have oxygen, but hey, cool. Let's say we take these two reactions 
and we did them one right after the other. So effectively the oxygen here would in essence get used up and no longer or would be used up in the second series of equations, in the second series of reaction. Well then effectively what we would have is the reaction we do care about. That eventually, essentially the oxygens, the O2 molecular oxygen drops out, and that just leaves us two moles of carbon monoxide, one mole of hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, both reacting in the gas state to form solid carbon, two moles of that, and liquid hydrogen peroxide. And to determine delta G, or this combination of reaction, is just simply adding top to bottom. So, in essence, what is delta G for this entire reaction? Well, it's just going to be this. If our first set of conditions is negative 474.2 kilojoules per mole, we are just going to add to that negative 120.4 kilojoules per mole. And therefore, in total, our reaction is going to be negative 594.6 negative 594.6 kilojoules if you guys ever do latex editing you would have a lot of fun with this uh, coding stuff for chemical equations. Anywho, basically all we did was we took our known set of reactions, our known two known chemical equations, and we essentially probed them a little bit to form the reaction we do care about, whether multiplying the entire reaction by some coefficient, which multiplies the change in free energy of that sub-reaction by the same coefficient, or we flipped a chemical equation around, which effectively took the starting delta G and we flipped its sign. And therefore, we if adding those two sub-chemical equations eventually gives us the chemical equation that we do care about, then to determine the free energy change of that reaction, all we had to do is just add up the sum of each part. And cool. And so what conclusion can we make about the reaction of gaseous carbon monoxide and gaseous molecular hydrogen forming car solid carbon and liquid hydrogen peroxide? Well, the ch change in free energy is very negative. Therefore, this reaction is actually spontaneous. It can occur naturally. Now, that being said, there is to think about how Carbon dioxide is like half a percent of the air we breathe, so carbon monoxide is even smaller. And the likelihood of two molecules of carbon monoxide coming together and hitting the same molecule of hydrogen, well, that's very low chance. So, even though this reaction is spontaneous, there are still other factors to consider, like the kinetics of will everything hit each other at the right point. But we're not worried about kinetics. So that's pretty much it for thermodynamics of this week, where essentially we went and calculated delta G from enthalpies, entropies, and temperature, and then applied Hess's law, which applies to change in enthalpy, to a situation where we use it to determine change in free energy of an unknown reaction. Later this week, I'm going to come up with an example problem for Hess's law for you guys to do and you guys will be able to do it for extra credit. As far as for the remainder of this semester, effectively, since we're now online, I'm going to be condensing a lecture to one video per week. And today we just did thermochemistry. Next week we will do electrochemistry. And then, let's see, the following Monday, after, so two Mondays from now, you're going to get access to 
a formal extra credit assignment, so AKA a practice exam, and then your third exam. And while that will be available to you on April 6th, it will not be due until a April 17th. So two Fridays from the date that you can access it. And then the following week on Monday, April 20th, we're gonna start nuclear chemistry. And then the last week of lecture will be organic and biomolecules. Effectively, I'm going to make that like a little introduction to organic chemistry, which is by far my favorite field in chemistry. And then just to give you a good amount of time, the Wednesday after our last lecture, you will gain access to your exam, your final, your last lecture exam. We do not have final exams, but you will have a fourth exam, and there will be an extra credit, aka practice exam, that goes along with it. That will be made available to you on April 29th and will be due the last day of classes for the regular semester, Friday, May 8th. Now, two last things I want you guys to know. Effectively, administration has changed up some things. Namely, midterm grades have been pushed back to Friday, April 10th, instead of being due this Friday. So, cool. Doesn't really affect anyone. However, this is what might be something to note. Your last day that you can drop or withdraw from a course without receiving a failing grade is now Friday, April 24th. And by that date, you will have already done your third exam and you will have already gotten your grade back for your third exam. And after April 24th, we will only have one more lecture and there will just be the fourth exam. So, you will know where you stand as far as the first three exams and most of the material that will be on the last exam before the last day you can withdraw. So, if this online format is not working out, you do have that. Anyways, that is thermodynamics. And as always, guys, it is a pleasure to be teaching you guys beautiful, beautiful chemistry. That's all for this week, guys.